You're good. All right. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You guys glad to be here? Yep. Yeah, I'm glad too. Um, I saw you rolling in like thunder. That's right. Rolling thunder. Right, Bill? That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, there's an inside joke on that one. Okay. Hey, so uh, just a reminder, we've got these little invitation cards over there. So uh, I think Andy was handing them, handing them out by the dozens this morning at Walmart, from what I hear. So uh, they're right over here. Use those as much as you like. And then uh, the VFW actually told us that uh, they're doing a blood uh, donation um, here on March 21st, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you're interested in doing that, I'll put that over there as well. And they're also doing a breakfast at the VFW here, ten dollars a plate on March 25th, and I'll put that over there as well. We just told them we'd we'd let you guys know. And then, um, let's see what else. Hi, come on in. Wave everybody to Nicole. Hello, Nicole. We, we love you, Nicole. All right. We've, we've been told it's really just awkward when you come in a little bit late. You come in in front of everybody. They, we've had a few people tell Andy he needs to turn it around or something. So we're just going to embrace people as they come in. We'll embrace the awkward. The, embrace the awkward. That's right. Um, and then um, I don't mean to point you guys out, but if you haven't met Nate and Crystal Woodland over here and they're girls, wave. <laughs> they, they, live down the, they live down the street from us on, on Polfer, and we've had the privilege of getting to know them a little bit over uh, the last few months. And so if you have not met them, you're missing out, so please do. And they're just wonderful people, and their girls are really sweet, too. All right, well, let's, uh, let's open up in prayer. Father, we do, uh, once again, just thank you for the opportunity to come together as, uh, as a family and just praise you and learn more about how to live like Jesus. Um, God, we love you so much, and we just pray that you're honored today as we uh, put our focus on you. We pray this in your beautiful son's name, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Tim, if you'll just grab the microphone and pull it closer, it, it works. That's what microphones do when you're the closer you get. <laughs> Thanks for the instructions. I, I just thought I'd help you out with that. Another, <laughs> this, this is a complicated piece of equipment to work. Um, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> Well, I hope you guys had a good week. Everybody have a good good time this week? Good week? Yeah. You survived. You made it through. Made it back to church. Yeah. We're continuing in 1 Corinthians. I appreciate Dave speaking last week. Did a fantastic job. I always enjoy it when Dave and Tim and you guys, uh, I always have, we have an open policy. Whenever they've got one ready, they tell me, and we put it up as soon as they want to. So I love it. It gives me a, a chance to listen to them and for them to get to share what God's laid on their heart. And I know you guys enjoy it too. The chapter we're going to look at today, we're in chapter 9, is where we're going into. And 1 Corinthians 9 is kind of an interesting chapter and, and a lot of times can be pulled out of the context that it's written in. And if we pull it out of context, we can make it into something that it's not. So in order to understand this chapter, we've got to remember our principle of Bible study, which is three words. Anybody remember what they are? Context, 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 context. context. Yep, it's real, real tough, real tough to remember. We got to remember the context of not just the setting that it's happening in, but what's happening on either side of it. So we got to look at the chapter before and the chapter after to understand what's going on. So this chapter works with chapter eight and chapter ten. It's not a standalone where you know Paul went squirrel or got you know chasing rabbits or something else like that. I read a commentary this week um, that puts these three chapters together, and instead of trying to remember the story to tell it to you, I wanted to read it to you because it was so good. Here it is. Imagine this scene. You're a member of a baseball team playing its most important game of the season. It's the bottom of the ninth inning. The score's tied. The bases are loaded. There's no outs, and you're up to bat. Taking a few practice swings on your way to the batter's box, you look down at the third base coach for the signal. Expecting a swing away sign... You begin to churn inside when he dips his hat, wipes his nose, and licks his thumb, the dreaded <laughs> sacrifice fly signal. What does the coach mean? You think to yourself, he expects me to fly out on purpose so the team can score? 
What about my 350 batting average? Give me a few swings and I can knock the ball out of the park. We'll win by four runs instead of one. And most of all, I'll end the game in a blaze of glory, just like Robert Redford in The Natural. <laughs> so you're faced with a decision. Will you sacrifice your right to hit the ball wherever you please in order to let another teammate get a run? Or will you grab for the glory by attempting to hit it out of the park? As we've already seen, the Corinthians team suffered from envy, selfish pride, and strife. Each member's viewpoint re reflected a distinct, isolated player, giving little thought to how one player's actions would affect the rest of the team. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1 to 18, Paul shows us the attitudes they practiced. Their pep cheer was, I've got my rights. Then in the dugout talk, Paul exhorts the team to model his own strategy for victory, placing the needs of the body of Christ above personal rights. Only when they begin to compete in the contest of life as members of a team, rather than individual players looking out only for themselves, would they be eligible for eternal rewards. I thought that was a great story, likening this chapter to a baseball team. And I, I enjoy baseball. I grew up going and watching the wonderful Cincinnati Reds and... In those days, they didn't win much. Um, when I was real young, we'd go and watch it. I remember watching Pete Rose play and, and being there and watching him uh, break the hit record and those kind of things. But then, you know, for about 20 years, they couldn't win anything. But I like baseball. So reading this and putting these two together, it helped me to see that this chapter is not a standalone, but it goes together. So the culture Paul's working with here is has been overrun by these charlatan, opportunistic soothsayers that would come into town and would charge people to come and listen to them give their new ideas, to share their wisdom. This, this market was flooded with all kinds of philosophical religious claims, and they wanted to get paid to get access to their enlightened ideas. So Paul goes, if, if Paul had come into Corinth and took up a love offering every time he spoke, he would have been lumped into that group just like the rest of these people who traveled and spoke. I mean, he would be immediately associated with these fakes. So Paul decided to do something different. He wanted to make sure that nothing that he did distracted from the message that he preached. And what was the message that he preached? This isn't a tough question. Anybody know what the message Paul preached was? The gospel. Yeah, the gospel. That's a Sunday school question. Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate you having my back there. Glad yeah. you came this morning. Yeah, for real. We'd still be sitting here. <laughs> so let's look at chapter 9 together. Chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I'm not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. I mean, Paul starts by defending his authority as an apostle of Jesus. Verse 3, this is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? Do we not have the right to take along a, bereave, a, a believing wife and do the other apostles and the brothers of our Lord and Cephas? Here's another verse. Remember how we, we talked about a few weeks ago and I said that some people believe that Paul had had a wife at one point in his life? This is one of the verses that they use that kind of help uh, support their claim. Verse 6, or is it only Barabbas and I who have to work to support ourselves? So now Paul's defending his right as a minister to receive pay, and Paul dealt with this in 1 Timothy as well. 1 Timothy 5, 17, he said, Elders who do their work well should res be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. So let's go on, verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 7. What soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing a merely a human opinion, or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says, You must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us, so that one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Paul's defending his, the right that he had to receive pay for the work that he was doing. Not because he wanted to get rich or not because any minister wants to get rich, but to provide for the daily needs so that the minister can focus on the ministry. 
Now, before you think I'm going to talk about you should pay me a bunch of money, this is not what this passage is talking about. So don't get lost in this. Remember I said it goes with 8 and it goes with 10. And I'm going to explain why Paul uses this as an illustration in a minute. So don't think I'm setting you up for something. I'm not, okay? So Paul's saying... I've got the right to do this. This is a normal thing. This is what's supposed to happen. You know, churches shouldn't think of paying a pastor as giving them a salary to work, but as meeting their financial needs so that they can fully focus on the ministry is what Paul's teaching them here. So verse 11, since we have planted spiritual seeds among you, aren't we entitled to harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than to be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. So why wouldn't Paul take anything from him? Because he did this, I mean, mean, why did he do this work full-time as a missionary? What was going on that he didn't want to accept that he he refused it? Well, even though Paul had the right to earn a living doing what he was doing as a missionary, he, he wisely chose in this situation not to accept anything from the church in Corinth for the greater good. He chose to surrender it for something that was bigger than that. He set aside his rights. Now you see where we're going with this? The last chapter about not eating meat, where we surrender our own rights for the good of others, for the sake of the gospel. That's what Paul's doing. He's the the same thing he just talked about with offering meat to idols in chapter 8. And he's using his own life as an illustration. He's not trying to justify a church paying a pastor. He's trying to justify surrendering our own rights for the greater good of everyone. That my rights are not what's most important, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most important thing. So he's using his own life as an illustration, offering the gospel free as an illustration to what he said in chapter 8. Specifically, that believers should renounce their rights if it'll help other believers. In a world where we always say, well, I have the right to this, or these are my rights. See how it focuses on me? Let me flip it another way that's saying the same thing but a little differently. You have no right to treat me that way. You have no right to talk to me. That's saying I have the right to be treated a certain way and to be talked to a certain way. And Paul's saying, I'm setting aside all of my rights, all of the things that are right for me, all of the things that I deserve, all the things that I could claim, so that there's nothing that could make you stumble at the gospel. Because serving our brothers and sisters matters more than our rights to do anything. Putting others first. Because what Paul's teaching is that love trumps freedom. Love is much more important. Verse 13, don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple? And those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings? Even the pagan priests, if you go all the way back in the Old Testament, that's how the priests of the the Israelites were fed was of the the stuff that was brought in as a sacrifice they would have a hook and there's this whole thing that that, it's an amazing story if you read it but if I just tell it to you real quick it'll bore you to tears Um, so let's just say they ate off the, the sacrifices and so did the pagan priests they would eat of the sacrifices that came in remember they would sell the meat that was used well they also kept some of that for themselves so even pagan priests would eat from the sacrifices And the Corinthians would definitely be getting what Paul's saying because they've seen this done their whole lives. Verse 14, in the same way the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Yet I have never used any of these rights. And I am not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Paul said, I would rather die than take a penny from you because you can't tell me what to say and you can't tell me what to do. Because you don't pay me. So there's nothing you can do that's going to affect me. I would rather die. That's pretty strong. (laughs) I've never heard a pastor say that before. (laughs) What verse were we on? (laughs) Oh, let's see. Uh, Verse 16. Is that where we were? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yeah, I got distracted by that. (laughs) Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I'm compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. Paul was a bivocational guy. He made tents to support himself. And he he did it to make sure that there was nothing that he did that would hold these people back from responding to the message that he was preaching. 
He didn't want them to look at him differently. Again, in this culture with these traveling teachers who would come in and demand money so that they would share their enlightened ideas, that was the normal. Paul wanted to be different. He didn't want to be lumped in with that crowd. So he said, I don't want anything from you. I just want you to hear what I am saying. And he was sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. That's different. He gave up his own rights. He, I mean, think about it. The thing that would take care of him so that he could focus fully on the ministry, he gave up and worked a job so that, he could, so that people would get saved. That shows his priorities right there, that he was willing to put his own needs and wants as a secondary to the gospel of Jesus. So, Paul never accepted support from this church. Now, there were churches that did send Paul support from time to time. He wasn't against taking it. But in this context, in this situation from this church in Corinth at this time, he didn't want them to associate him with the false teachers. So that's why he did this. Verse 17, if I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. What then is my pay? It's the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Wow, that's a great phrase. Even though I am a free man with no master, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. He starts to tie the idea of this, this, with this church's false idea of freedom together with what he's talking about here. And as Christians, we have the right to our liberties. We talked about that last week or, or two weeks ago. We have the right to our Christian liberty. If we can do something with a clear conscience, then we have the rights to be able to do that. But Paul, I mean, he, he gave up what he wanted. And even though we have the rights and the liberties in our position of, uh, in our relationship with Christ to enjoy everything that God has for us, Paul willingly set it aside so that he could reach people with the gospel. We also have a responsibility and privilege of sharing the gospel and building other Christians up in their faith. And if my liberty would cause someone not to come to Christ, then I need to rethink my liberty. I need to not practice that in front of someone if it's going to be a stumbling block. Because, and, and that calls for humility. That calls for sacrifice. And it calls for teamwork. And if there's ever a church that if they could possibly get something upside down and backwards, it was this church. And the Corinthians were going to find a way to get it wrong. And they had used their freedom to feed their egos and to feed their flesh leaders' desires and, and their liberty and their selfish pursuits. And Paul was trying to teach them that the Christian life is not about you and about your freedom. It's about something bigger. It's about the gospel. It's about being able to reach people for Jesus. He goes on in verse 20. When I was with the Jews, I lived like the Jews to bring the Jews to Christ. And when I was with those who followed Jewish law, I lived under the, that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. And when I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. I'm going to stop right there because so many people take these two verses to say, well, Paul was everything to everybody, so we should just be everything to everybody. So if somebody's you know, at the bar hanging out, I can go do that with them because Paul said I'm supposed to be all things to all men. You know, they're at the strip club down there, so I'm just trying to serve Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but what does Paul say? It, it, Paul said, this is about the law, living under the Jewish law. When I'm with the Jews who live under the Jewish law, I, I follow the Jewish law, the dietary restrictions, all the other stuff. When I'm with the Gentiles, I don't follow that because I don't want it to be a stumbling block to them. But here's how we know Paul wasn't involved in their sin by the next phrase. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. No matter who Paul was with, he always obeyed the law of Christ. He didn't get into sin to reach people with the gospel. He just put away stumbling blocks that Christians can have to keep people from coming to the gospel. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak ones to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everybody, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. Paul's goal was to get the gospel to everybody he could. Verse 24. Don't you realize that in a race, now here's how he's going to tie it all together, and you'll see why this has nothing to do with the way this chapter is mostly interpreted about having to pay your preacher really good. The TV evangelists like to use this section, and they abuse this section. Um, don't you realize that in a race, everybody runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it to win an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, 
training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul uses the illustration of, uh, of his purpose, uh, about Paul's uh, his race here that he's in. I'm, every step has a purpose. And his purpose would have hit home with these Corinthian people, this story, this illustration would, because Corinth was only 10 miles from the site where they held the Isthian Games. The Isthian Games were, were kind of in between. They were a year before and a year after the Olympics. So they kind of went together. And they were in this area. They happened twice every four years. So our modern Olympic Games that we have today are modeled after these ancient athletic contests. And here's what they included. Chariot racing. That'd be pretty cool to watch. Yeah. Wrestling. I could get behind that. Boxing. Music and poetry. How about if we added music and poetry to the Olympics? I don't think that'd get a lot of airtime. I don't think too many people would be tuning in to watch poetry at the Olympics. Maybe you would. That's just not my cup of tea. Um, I'll watch the rest of it. But yeah. So these ancient Greek athletes who won these Isthian Games in the Olympics, they would be given this, this crown, so to speak, of, and it was either made out of celery or pine. That was your big prize. <laughs> Here's two celery sticks. Enjoy. <laughs> you know, it was all that work and all the, the effort and the sacrifice and everything, and that's what you win. And Paul uses this illustration to show that he's disciplining himself not to win a prize that's going to deteriorate and rot and be gone in six months, but something that was eternal, an eternal crown, an eternal prize. So he uses this athletic illustration to explain that all Christians are not going to be rewarded equally in the way that they live, because of the way they live or invest their time or energy. He's already told them, and we talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that some of them, when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, their works are going to be tested. They're going to be tried with fire. Some are going to be wood, hay, and stubble. They're going to be just burned up, and there's going to be nothing less, kind of like the crown of celery or pine. It's not going to last. But there are those who are going to receive a crown for the Lord from the Lord for their faithful service that is going to last. If we live our life selflessly, selflessly and, and we seek the needs of others. So Paul encourages these Corinthian Christians these dedicated athletes to run to win. Go after it for a purpose. Because anybody can get your number. You can register for a race and you can get your number and you can put it on your chest and you can get out on the marathon and you can you know, stand and stretch just like everybody else and you can do all of these things to look just like you're a part of the race. But it's only the ones who finish the race who get the prize. I don't know if you ever watched The Office, but there's a sh an episode. It's funny. It's probably not the best show to watch, but I like The Office. I think it's hilarious. Um, where they do this marathon for, what was it? Rabies. <laughs> they were raising money for rabies awareness. And a couple of the guys, they put their, their number on, and they shoot the gun, and everybody starts to run, and they get in a taxi cab. And they ride around, and they have a few drinks, and then they ride the taxi cab to just around the corner from the finish line, and they jump out and they cross the finish line. <laughs> That's not going to win the race for us. That's not going to, you can look good, but unless you do it the right way, unless you really run to win, you're not going to have any kind of a reward. And Paul contrasts these earthly rewards with these Isthian games, with the eternal heavenly reward that comes from following Christ. And he argues, he does this special argument, it's from the lesser to the greater, is what he's doing. So from the useless to the priceless. So if, those rewarded with this withering wreath that's not going to last, that's going to fall apart, the, if those people would discipline their bodies, if they would give up things that they enjoy, foods that they like, training day after day after day, out running. I mean, running. Nobody likes to run. <laughs> if I'm running, you better run faster than me because something really bad is happening behind me. But to give these things up, if they're willing to do that for this crown that's going to just fall apart in no time at all, how much more should we as Christians be disciplining ourselves and giving up things that really don't matter so that we can further the cause of Christ, so that we can get the gospel out, so we can get people to Jesus? So 
We can take this, context, this, this passage out of its context and we can use it for whatever we want to. But if we'll keep it in where it's at and where it is and, Paul, and see that Paul is using his own life as an illustration to teach people that the gospel should be put above our own rights. If we'll con- and see that he's continuing his thought about abstaining from meat that's offered from idols, then there's a couple things we can see in this passage that we can apply and we can learn and we can grow together and see what Paul's really teaching us. So here's the three thoughts that I got for this morning. I'm just going to hit them quick and we'll be finished. Here's the first one. Just because I have the right to do something doesn't mean that I should do it. Just because I have the right to do something doesn't mean that I should do it. Paul set aside his rights so that there was no distractions to spreading the gospel. Remember, these people were used to these charlatans, these false teachers coming in and charging them to give them some weird ideas. But Paul set aside his rights to be able to earn a living so that these people would hear the gospel. That's the first one. Here's the second one. My life should be more focused on others than on myself. My life is not about me. Paul said when he was with the Jews that he followed the Jewish laws, and when he was with the Gentiles, he didn't follow the Jewish laws. Why? So that he could reach them with the gospel. That doesn't mean he participated in the things that were sin. We talked about that because he said that he always followed the laws laws of Christ. But what he did is find common ground. He made a connection with them. He became relational. He, He got to know them. He had rapport with them so that he could show them a better way of life, following Christ. It's a beautiful picture of love. He loved them enough to give up his own freedoms around them to reach them with the gospel. He put the needs of others ahead of himself. Here's the third one. Loving this, living this kind of life requires discipline because it's not easy. Does it say loving or living? It should say living. The person who typed these just messed it all up. They did my notes too. That was me. Um, living this kind of life requires discipline because it's not easy. Training like an athlete for these Isthian games or the Olympics is not easy. I mean, there's a lot of sacrifice, giving up comfort, exercise, training. You can't sit on the couch watching TV with your half-gallon tub of ice cream and your Doritos and expect to win at the Olympics, right? Unless we're, we've entered the new Big Splash competition or something like that. Um, it's not going to work. You don't see professional athletes living that kind of life. That, that, it's not going to work for them during when they're training. It all comes down to, to the prize. What do we want at the end? Do I want the crown at the end? Do I want to stand on the platform and hear my national anthem played and get that gold, whatever it is, around my neck, that award, that trophy? Do I want to win the gold medal or do I want to what? What's my purpose? Because it takes sacrifice, commitment, blood, sweat, and tears. But it reminds me of the old hymn from years, years ago that says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. I wrote the words down to that old hymn, and I want you just to listen to them. Don't think about them as a song. Just listen to the words. Because that's the problem with a lot of songs is when we get used to them, our brain goes into neutral, and we just sing them, and we don't think about what we're saying. So just think about this. Oftentimes, the day seems long, and our trials are hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. You ever been there? You ever been tempted to complain, murmur, and despair? Daily. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. Sometimes the sky looks dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on. There's no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. So let Jesus solve your problems. Just go to him in prayer. The third verse, life's day will soon be o'er and all all storms forever past. We'll cross that great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven, a harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished. Boy, that'll be awesome. We'll lay our burdens down in the chorus as it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. So let's talk about it. What do you think about this chapter? What jumps out to you? Not everybody all at once. 
one of the things that kind of came to me when you were talking about uh, Paul not accepting the payment mm -hmm. so that he could be focused solely on ministry. You can't do that unless, like, you, you can't give a ministry that you haven't prepared for unless you're getting a word from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of proof that God's in his, in his ear. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Who else? Something jump out at you. Well, you guys are quiet this morning. Yeah? <clears throat> um, for me, the training, when he said I train my body to do what it's supposed to do. And I think a lot of times we don't want to train our bodies because we're comfortable. And, but it's work that we have to put in if we want the joy that's ahead you know are you talking spiritual or physical or both yes no, <laughs> i'm talking spiritual but yeah the other two i guess yep absolutely i would say for me it was his sacrifice the fact that he knew he could get paid but mm -hmm. he could he was thinking about what that would do for the Lord's, you know, gospel, how people could twist and turn it. And so he had so much love and, you know, admonishment for the Lord that he wanted to honor his gospel in a way that he was like, I'm not going to allow anybody to twist and turn. Mm -hmm you know, what I'm trying to do, and that's hard. So is there anything that you can think of today that we would, that someone might say, I'm, I need to put this aside even though it's right or I have rights to it so that I could share the gospel with somebody else? For me, it's uh, sometimes just... Um, Kind of back to what you said on feeling like you deserve to be treated a certain way. Okay. And so I find myself having to deal with that all the time because in one sense it's like, okay, but when is enough enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if someone is treating you, but yet you always be in the, taking the higher road and doing the forgiving mm -hmm. and, you know, that's a hard one. It is. A very hard one for me. Very. Because then I struggle like, okay, I know that I have to be forgiving. I know that I have to, you know, still show God's love because he did it for us when we were crucifying his son, mm -hmm. you know. But then I think, well, like, how much do I have to keep doing to the point where now it's emotionally making me have hate or anger or bitterness in my heart you know what I mean so it's like what's that fine line of standing up for myself so I don't get to that point but also still being able to take that higher road mm -hmm. and you know still love on someone even though they might not be in their believer you know I can understand if it wasn't a believer but that's where I start tussling with is if you're a believer and you say you're a believer, and you say, you know, that you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you're trusting in God, then at what point do I keep just allowing that to happen? That's a good question. Who I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to see what you guys have to say about that. Because that's a good question. Who has something that you can share about that? I don't know if this helps entirely, but this week the ladies and I that got together Friday, one of the things that I read was, it was talking about consequences of sin, but I think it's still applicable. When we're suffering consequences from our sin, God knows when enough is enough, and he steps in. So maybe in your situation, God knows when enough is enough of what you can handle. And I guess just keeping our eyes on him and asking him to fight that battle for you. And he knows when enough is enough. That's good. That's really good. Anybody else have an insight on that? Or? I tend to sometimes get caught of 
the whole tit for tat. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody's uh, mistreating me or something, I can get mean. I don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you fall into that, you're really not doing God any service. Mm -hmm. It's easy for us to fall into that, for sure. Bill, you're you raising your hand. Yeah, I guess. You guess? <laughs> well, you've been voluntold now. <laughs> I was thinking about, uh, you know, in our culture today, alcohol is probably, you know, it's. We know that we have the privilege to drink if we, as believers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, but I think that. A lot of times, Christians are taking that liberty too far, and you know you even see like old Christian friends, you know, on Facebook. They'll they'll be having a good time, and they've got to post a, a picture of a, a alcoholic drink, you know, to you know sh let everybody know they're having a good time. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. what does that have to do with having a good time? So, I think if you have those, uh, you know beliefs or liberties that you need to be careful with that mm -hmm. and uh, you know our culture's changing for sure and as the younger generation comes on things are becoming more acceptable uh, I was kidding around with you uh, last week you know about how that someday maybe churches will say at a picnic BYOB bring your own beer yeah. you know and, y and you said uh, well it might even be uh, bring your own uh, marijuana you know and because <laughs> they've legalized that and of course then where does the bible talk about uh you know marijuana it's grown naturally you know so people have an argument against that too and i know i'm a long haired guy but i don't drink i don't do drugs you know? <laughs> sure you know, you know. busting the stereotypes here. <laughs> but you know that's something that those little those little things as believers that i think that uh, we have to be careful with those kind of things, you know. Yeah. And, uh, just, you know, be aware of them. If, if you feel like it's your liberty to drink wine at your house, then be careful with that. And I think a lot of times, too, is a lot of people don't see how that they're uh, taking these liberties into their lives and their generations of their families. Maybe they have kids and and they have a problem with that later on in life. Maybe it's because of their liberty that they took. Mm -hmm. you know? so, and I got one other thing to say too. I like that NASB translation where it says Paul buffeted his body. You know? Buffeted. I think that's pronounced buffeted. And it has to do with beating, not feeding. <laughs> but I, I like the other one too. good bill <laughs> i think a lot of people equal um american rights a lot of times with god-given rights and they mm -hmm. get it confused and they're wet, ready to stand on some kind of pedestal because it's an american right and you know we don't want to let a lot of those go either we don't mm -hmm. want our country to go down the tubes but that's not like that's not something i'm going to die upon <laughs> and uh, i think Especially since all those things we went through, it's like, uh, um, with all the rules and all that, and just things, people just got, Christians got crazy about it, about, you know, I'm like, where is that in the Bible? Hmm. Well, you know. Paul was a great example of that. He was a Roman citizen, but he never brought that up until he was about to be killed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had the right, he had, if anybody had rights, he had rights. No one could have laid a hand on him. No one could have beat him. <laughs> All he had to do was say the word, and they could have, they could have been in serious trouble. But instead, he chose because he's the one who says he's an ambassador of God's, and that means our home is not of this earth. And he only used that when it was uh, to appeal for his life. <laughs> but yeah, there is there is a version of American Christianity that is so far removed from the Bible that it's scary. I agree with you, Pam, big time. I think it kind of has to do with everybody's got rights but at some point in life Satan can take a right and turn it into a vice very easily mm -hmm. <coughs> and, 
we just have to watch out for that line. And it's really easy to see that line once you've crossed it. It's really difficult to see it coming. That's true. Anybody one, else? One quick comment about Nicole's um, yeah. she brought up. I mean, there's a difference between being abused and then maybe suffering for without question. You know, Christian testimony at work or something like that. God without is question. never asking you to stay in a an abusive situation where you're being harmed. Absolutely. And so there should be no guilt about removing yourself from <coughs> an environment like that. Um, you know, the, the forgiveness of uh, of that person or whatever, that's that's a that's a different that's almost mm -hmm. a, a different issue. It doesn't mean you have to stay in that. Yeah, absolutely. The Bible says to turn the other cheek, but it's not talking about putting yourself into a position to be abused. Yeah. I don't think there's ever a, a right or a reason to stay, to willingly step back into something where you know you're going to get abused. <clears throat> yeah. I agree with that 100%. Dave, yeah. you were about to say something? Yeah, Bill mentioned alcohol because a lot of us were taught for years, you know, that one drink and that was like you were going to hell for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we all kind of, I think we all realize, well, the Bible doesn't say that, but uh, that's what we were taught. But, but we, we're, so, we're so prone to wanting to figure out, like, technically, what the what the border is and what we can do, mm -hmm. and trying to get as close to it as we can. You know, we, we love to dance mm -hmm. you know, like on the, on the edge. And, yep. And Paul says, "I just put my body and keep it under control." The real question, I mean, self control is a fruit of the spirit. Absolutely. So the question you should be asking yourself is, why am I doing this? Because I can technically, or who's really the boss? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this an example? <coughs> Of, uh, of my body telling me what to do as opposed to me telling mm -hmm. my body what to do. So I yeah. think we look at, we, we discuss it in the wrong context. Yeah. You know, everything we do, we ought to have a reason for it. That's not just because I can or I felt like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good. There was an old preacher back um, late 1800s who told a story, and my dad's used the story, and a bunch of other preachers have used it too, about a very wealthy man who needed a chariot driver, somebody to drive his, his horses, and he would ride in the in the back of the carriage. So he would he he was looking. So he advertised this cliff, this really steep road that had just a sheer cliff on it. He wanted to see who could drive up that hill and see how good they were and how close they could get and all this stuff. So all these guys would take this thing and see how close they could get to the edge. But the the last guy who came through drove as far away from the edge as he could, and that's the guy he hired. <laughs> yeah, so I, that's a, a great, great way to look at things, Dave. Absolutely. Anybody else before we finish? Yes, ma'am. Um, back to the abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I, there are times that I, I'm, I have that situation in my family, and uh, I've had to step away from a person that's very close to me, but. That doesn't mean that I don't still love that person. Sure. And I pray for that person almost daily mm -hmm. because they have issues that they need to deal with. And yes. Until they do, I just can't go right. back to that. We situation. have to forgive. We have to yeah. love, but we, we don't have, have to, to put ourselves in the position to right. be abused. And continue to pray for that person. Absolutely. Yeah. There's something going on in their heart. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Very good, Judy. Thank you. Anybody else? Who's wrapping up today? Brad. Brad's wrapping up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> he visits and he gets to be put to work. <laughs> we'll show you. You come and visit with us. You're going to have to talk. Hey, let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to get together for fellowship, Lord. Thank you for the freedom to do so. We ask you to just go ahead of us this week. And give us the strength and boldness to be ambassadors for your name and your kingdom. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.